Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 4, Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Things. The episode where Jon Snow meets lifelong BFF, Samuel Tarly, the mountain kills a guy in the hands tourney, and Catelyn Stark returns Tyrion's favor of designing a saddle for her crippled son with a friendly citizen's arrest. Now, I'm stoked to be back working our way through the earlier seasons of the show, pointing out all the interesting connections and setups we missed the first time around. Starting with this opening dream scene with Bran and Winterfell standing, practicing his archery when he he sees this raven with three eyes. Now this scene is a very toned down adaptation from the dream sequence in the book, A Game of Thrones. Let's actually go over this and all the ways the episode compared to the source material in our segment, um, well, in the books. So as I'd mentioned before, in the books, the three-eyed crow appears to Bran in a far more surreal vision, soaring him high above the continent of Westeros, where he sees his family on the King's Road and beyond the wall and dragons stirring in the Shadowlands of Essos. And then he wakes up from his coma, not before the vision, like the show had him do at the end of episode two. It actually makes sense that the series would restrain themselves on these cryptic supernatural elements so early in the run as we're still kind of getting to know the world and the characters. Later, when Tyrion runs into Theon at Winterfell, he says this. I still remember seeing my father's fleet burn in Lannisport. I believe your uncles were responsible. Must have been a pretty sight. Now they're referring to the Greyjoy Rebellion, the attempt by Theon's father, Balon Greyjoy, to secede from the Seven Kingdoms nine years earlier, which ended in defeat when they were driven back to Pike. This siege on Pike actually comes up later this episode with Jory and Jamie, two soldiers who helped quell that rebellion. By embracing this recent history from the books, these early episodes firmly established the Seven Kingdoms as naively optimistic about their unity. Yeah, it's not gonna last. This defeat is also the reason Theon is in Winterfell. He's being kept as a ward by the Starks, more or less a high hostage to prevent Balon Greyjoy from any future aggression. So Tyrion reminding Theon of this history is an insult, but also in a way goading Theon to take control of his seemingly stagnant position in life, and to finally act just like Tyrion did with Jon, but more on this later. And then notice the reason Jorah tells Danny that he sold slaves. I have no money and an expensive wife. And where is she now? In another place with another man. So in the books, we learn that Jorah's wife was Lyness Hightower, who grew impatient with her far less luxurious life than she was used to. Actually, there's a very similar dilemma to her cousin, Steve Hightower. Jorah went into financial ruin trying to please Lyness, and while in exile, she left him for Tregar or Molin, a rich merchant in the free city of Lees. I ain't saying she a gold digger, but... Mm. In the books, Jorah also sees Daenerys as very similar in appearance to Lyness, also in being way too young for him. However, compared to Lyness, Danny has more easily adapted to a life in exile without a silver spoon. So to him, Danny is the low maintenance road trip wife he always wanted. Speaking of creepy age gaps, Littlefinger tells Sansa the origin story of the mountain and the hound. One evening, Gregor found his little brother playing with a toy by the fire. Gregor's toy. Gregor never said a word. He just grabbed his brother by the scruff of his neck and shoved his face into the burning coals. In the book, this goes down a little differently. The Hound actually runs into Sansa and tells her this frightening story himself. The crew cited production reasons for this change, like maybe the actors couldn't be available on set the same day. But I like how it now establishes this uncomfortably close relationship between Sansa and Peter, which will obviously play a bigger role as the series goes on. Actually, let's move on here to the other moments this episode with interesting connections to future events. But for those of you who somehow haven't seen the series or read the books, you can skip to this time to avoid any discussion of later story beats. Okay, with the losers gone, let's look at this episode in hindsight. Okay, so very early in the episode, when Theon enters Bran's chamber to bring him downstairs, notice how Summer welcomes him. Now, of course, in the moment, we could see this as Summer being cautious against any visitors, let alone an outsider to the family. But in hindsight, yeah, this is totally foreshadowing Theon's betrayal of Bran in season two, when he seizes Winterfell. In fact, this whole interaction with the Bran is more or less repeated beat for beat when he does that. I've taken your castle. It's Theon. It's Prince Theon now. Did you hate us the whole time? Actually, I like how later this episode, Jamie also hints at this betrayal. Theon, he's a good lad. I doubt it. Next, Rob and Tyrion's tense exchange is interesting. I'm not your boy, Lannister. I'm Lord of Winterfell while my father is away. And you might learn a lord's courtesy. As we'll see in seasons two and three, Rob ends up defying those old customs when he breaks his vow to Walder Frey and marries Talisa, leading Frey to offer him his version of a lord's courtesy. <laughs> Moving on to the city of Vyas Dothrak, we get this interesting sex position scene between Doria and Viserys that foreshadows two things. First, there's this moment. To nothing. 
melted. Like so many candles. Ow. The fact that Viserys reacted to getting burned here tells us that despite his ravings, he is not a dragon and he can be burned, as Danny summed up to us after he got crowned. He was no dragon. Fire cannot kill a dragon. Shortly after this, Doria says this. I've seen a man who could change his face the way that other men change their clothes. Doria is almost certainly referring to one of the faceless men, Jacques Agar's Colton Bravos, who we'll see in future seasons. In King's Landing, Ned says this to Pycelle as he ruminates John Aaron's death. Poison is a woman's weapon. Pycelle adds that eunuchs are also known to use poison, casting suspicion on Varys. Now, the assumption was that the woman who poisoned John Aaron was Cersei, but of course, in season four, we learned that it was John's wife, Liza Aaron. You gave me those drops and told me to pour them into John's wine. My husband's wife. And this whole idea of poison being a woman's weapon came back in a new interesting way in the recent season seven, when Cersei delivered the Queen's justice to Ilaria Sand by kissing her daughter Tyene with poison lips, poetic punishment for Ilaria doing the same to her daughter, Marcella. Now, in the next scene with Ned and Arya, listen closely to the background. Well, he needs to get his strength back first. Now, those are the bells of the Sept of Baylor, which, as I pointed out in my breakdown of episode three, also clang when Ned speaks to Arya in a previous scene. In both cases, it's just a really cool way that the season foreshadows Arya hearing those bells on the morning of Ned's execution. Now, Ned tells Arya about her future, marrying a noble lord and having kids, and Arya responds this way. That's not me. Arya will echo this rogue independence when she reunites with her direwolf Nymeria in season seven, allowing her to run away from a domestic life. That's not you. And then when Littlefinger instructs Ned on the numerous spies throughout the Red Keep, he gives him this ominous advice. Distrusting me was the wisest thing you've done since you climbed off your horse. Littlefinger is telling Ned that he's going to betray him here. So Ned's later decision to confide with Littlefinger on his plans after Robert's death was a super dumb move. Let's actually close out this in hindsight section by looking at Ned's other huge mistakes this episode. Right after Littlefinger warned Ned that spies are watching him everywhere he goes, Ned says this to Jory outside the armory. You shouldn't be out here, my lord. There's no telling who has eyes where. Let them look. Also, earlier this episode, Ned donates 20 of his own household guard to Jano Slint to help the city watch, something that catches a small council by surprise. Because yeah, Ned is needlessly weakening his own personal defenses, making it easy for the city watch to overpower them later. Then towards the end of the episode, when Cersei meets with Ned, she pretends to make peace with him over the King's Road incident, but Ned just refuses to play along and rudely cuts her off. What are you doing here? Just come on, Ned. Just Play along, play the game for one second. Ned easily could have continued his investigation quietly while doing the bare minimum to endear Cersei and not call attention to his actions. But nah, this honorable northerner cannot do it. He has to openly confront Cersei, basically telling the queen to her face, lady, I'm coming for you. Yeah, not a good idea. Okay, moving on from connections to the future to the interesting parallels to past moments in our segment, callbacks. Another scene that was actually written to pad out the episode run time was this one between Sansa and Septa Mordain in the throne room. And notice the catty exchange between them. I've told you a hundred times, a dire wolf Please is not- shut up about it. This is a meta joke and a callback to episode two. The writer of this episode, Brian Cogman, suggested episode two be titled, A Dire Wolf Is No Pet, instead of The King's Road, its actual title. The showrunner David Benioff hated that idea so much that he ordered that no episode could ever be called A Dire Wolf Is No Pet. So Sansa cutting off Septa Mordain here is a nod to that inside joke. Later, when Danny and Viserys argue, she snaps this at him. You've no right to a braid. You've won no victories yet. And as she finishes this line, notice how the camera lingers on Danny's braid. Now, this is a callback to Danny starting to have her hair braided last episode after her first victory of shutting down her brother. This braid will grow longer and increasingly ornate as the series goes on. And later, when John tells Sam about his near first time, notice the name of the woman. A whore named Roz. <laughs> what color hair? Red. This is actually a callback to earlier this episode. I assume this is the same Roz in Winterfell that Theon recommends to Tyrion. If you like redheads, ask for Roz. Uh, Roz must be some woman. I guess we know where John got his thing for redheads. Let's move on here to a few cultural references in this episode and a brief segment of Under the Influence. First, back in that scene with Dorian Viserys, notice the names of the dragons that Viserys lists. There was Giscar and Valryon, Vermithrax, 
So, Vermithrax is not one of the Targaryen dragons in the A Song of Ice and Fire books. It's actually added to this episode as an homage to the dragon in the 1981 movie Dragon Slayer. The creators of the show, including George R. R. Martin, ranked Dragon Slayer as a great fantasy film and a major influence on the Game of Thrones. Another interesting reference in this episode came in Alistair Thorne's spooky tale of being stranded in the blizzard north of the wall. The horses died first. Didn't have enough to feed them, to keep them warm. Eating the horses was easy. But later when we started to fall, that wasn't easy. It's interesting to see how genuinely haunted Thorne looks while revisiting this memory. The writer actually referred to this scene as the Robert Shaw in Jaws scene, saying that he drew from Quint's similarly haunted monologue to the two younger men in Jaws. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. I like how even John Williams' score seems to have influenced Ramin Djawadi's White Walker theme. These are two of my all-time favorite scores and I just never noticed this connection. Okay, let's move on to talk about a few interesting visual choices this episode, looking closely at some shots in our segment, Zoom in Enhance. So when Sir Hugh dies this horribly violent death during the joust, notice this little fly that buzzes around the wound, already sensing his coming death. This little morbid detail really brings to life what is already a visceral, unsettlingly real death. The first time we really see someone bleed out out like this on the show. In fact, the director didn't allow Sophie Turner and Maisie Williams on set during rehearsal so that their reactions would be genuinely shocked. Kudos to Maisie for adding this little glimmer of fascination on Arya's face as she watches him die. A little psycho. But the gore and the realism of this death makes a promise that the knights and the warriors of Game of Thrones don't go down with clean cinematic deaths. George R. R. Martin's fantasy world is far more cruel. And then let's look closely at this closing shot with Catelyn arresting Tyrion. This man came into my house as a guest, and there conspired to murder my son. I call upon you to seize him. <laughs> Michelle Fairley is amazing here. This is actually the scene she auditioned with to get the role of Catelyn Stark. But it's interesting how this downward pointed shot accentuates Tyrion's smallness. The number of swords here is totally unnecessary to seize him. He's impossibly outmatched. I think this image is a really good illustration of how, despite his good intentions, a world of taller men will always see Tyrion's smallness as a threat. And that brings us to the deeper meaning of this episode. This episode is titled Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Things, obviously taken from Tyrion's line early in the episode a direct quote from George R. R. Martin's book. I have a tender spot in my heart for cripples, bastards, and broken things. Tyrion's empathy for the imperfect will never win over the masses. If anything, it makes them more despised. But it does ally him with some surprising fellow cripples, bastards, and broken things. Bran, Jon, but also Theon. Rewatching these early episodes, it's interesting to see Tyrion's role in activating each of these misfit toys. He advises Jon to wear his bastard status like armor. He supplies Bran with his first real step to a life of movement. And he even lights a fire under Theon, reminding him that he's a Greyjoy, beginning his journey to seek his father's approval and turn on the Starks. And as we'll see throughout the series, in the world of Game of Thrones, the outcasts are the ones who bring about the most change. These four, but also Jaime in later seasons, Arya, the Hound, Brienne. These early episodes kind of misdirect us into thinking that the Game of Thrones will follow the classic fantasy structure, with Ned, Catelyn, and Robb Stark leading the charge as the apparent heroes. But if you're paying attention, the true heroes changing the world in discreet but powerful ways are the cripples, bastards, and broken things. Which of the Starks do you think are the most foolish this episode, Ned for his sloppy investigation in King's Landing, Catelyn for arresting Tyrion, or Rob for alienating Tyrion and dismissing the old customs that'll come back to haunt him. I just love how much we used to support these idiots. This cast was just so charming. I want to know your thoughts, so comment down below or tweet me directly at EA Boss and follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. Like and share this video around. Trust me, if this rewatch series takes off, we'll start doing these classic breakdowns a lot more frequently. And subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of Game of Thrones and all the stuff that you love. And if you really like us, contribute to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our donors, especially Wilhelmina Ebison. Thanks for watching. Bye.